biweekly call of the proposed project plan, Return to Travel. Today, our topic is everything you always wanted to know about jet lag, but were too afraid to ask. We just want to recognize our organizational team that puts these calls together. Uh, for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Carmen Smith. I am the Senior Travel Manager of Travel and Events for ICF. Also part of our organizational team is Andrew Wilcox. He is the Manager of Travel for Europe and Asia for ICF. We have Charlie Grappone, Team Leader for Sales for Citizen M Hotels, Roman Neumeister, Travel Officer of OSCE, Kathy Rigby, Program Manager for Travel Risk and Safety for the CFA Institute, and then also part of ICF, Tanya Fairbaugh and Carly Van Dyke. Housekeeping items that we would like to discuss with you, this session will be recorded. Please mute your phones and make sure that your cameras are off. Please put all questions in the chat box. And any questions that are not answered at the end of the call, we will send those out along with the recording of this call. At this time, I would like to introduce our presenter for today. His name is Mickey Bear Clausen. He's a Danish born New York based serial entrepreneur with a long track record of building genre defining companies. Uh, in the 90s, uh, Mickey was one of the first to launch an internet business. And since then, he has pioneered multiple mobile applications to improve the lives of people. Currently, Mickey is the co founder and CEO of Time Shifter, a circadian science company best known for most downloaded and high rated jet lag apps in the world. And before this, uh, Mickey was the several co founder of several businesses, including Mental Workout, Trunk Archive, Osseo Technologies, and Internet Payment Systems Scandinavia. At this time, please help me welcome Mickey Bayer Clausen. Mickey, all yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carmen. Can you see my screen? We can, yes. Yes. Okay. That's wonderful. Perfect. Uh, let me just see if I can go full screen here. Um, let's see. There we go. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, and uh, Carmen mentioned uh, my name is Miki Bayer Clausen. I'm the co founder and CEO of Time Shifter. Um, it's a Canadian science company with um, several products in pipeline, but uh, the first one uh, is a jet lag app that can help people adapt to new time zones really quickly based on the latest in sleep and circadian neuroscience. So um, I really want to make sure I answer all the questions you have around circadian science and jet lag and immune function and all this, uh, all the good stuff um, that um, I, I have some ex expertise in. But initially, I'm going to take you through a, a deck with um, some of that information, scientific information of the jet lag science, um, some of the implications of jet lag. Uh, including uh, how it weakens our immune function. Um, and uh, I'll also chat a little bit about uh, the Time Shifter app that uh, since 2008 has helped uh, hundreds of thousands of people with uh, with uh, tackling jet lag and the underlying cause of jet lag. So um, anyway, I'll spend probably the first 35, 40 minutes um, taking you through um, the story uh, and then uh, any questions you have, please uh, please ask them at the end of my presentation. And as Carmen said, if they're not answered uh, before we end this session today, I'm happy to answer them afterwards. Um, uh, so that's not a problem. Yes, so the presentation is uh, is uh, labeled Fight Jet Lag with Rocket Science. You understand why Rocket Science uh, is uh, is in fact part of that um, a title. And, um, and then strengthen the immune function in the process. So just initially, Carmen mentioned my bio, but one thing she didn't mention and didn't know probably is the fact that um, my mom was a flight attendant for 45 years with Scandinavian Airlines. So I practically grew up on a plane. And um, uh, therefore, I also know very, uh, very well what jet lag means. And in fact, uh, back then and, 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 and until uh, I, I started Time Shifter with uh, a Harvard professor we'll talk about in a little bit. 
Um, I never thought jet lag would be something you could cure. So I'm really thrilled uh, that I have some answers now, and I hope that you'll be as excited as, um, as I am. So yes, most of us know how it feels to experience jet lag, right? So unable to focus during that key business meeting or waking up in the middle of the night and cannot fall back asleep. Uh, and then there's, you know, coming back on a Friday afternoon from a long haul flight and uh, your kids want to play and your and your spouse expects you to be part of the of the chores and you're just a zombie on the couch, completely exhausted uh, and not able to function well. And of course, there are many, many more um, significant financial and human costs of jet lag. Some we all know, some are maybe a little bit more hidden. Uh, here's a list of some of them. Um, and uh, uh, one lesser known uh, significant reason why we should actually care about jet lag, especially right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, where we uh, really want our immune functions and system to be as strong as possible, is that jet lag, which is really a temporary circadian disruption, it weakens our immune function. So the longer you're jet lagged, the longer you have a weak immune function. And, um, you know, for shift workers, which are experiencing the same circadian disruption just much more often, uh, you can see this reflected in increased um, uh, strokes, uh, diabetes, um, heart disease, um, uh, certain cancers, uh, all of it uh, long term implications from disrupting your circadian rhythm. And so uh, today I feel anyone traveling on long haul flights. Uh, should not only do uh, address jet lag because of the performance uh, benefits, because of, it, it increases enjoyment, because of your family, should also do it because it in fact is, is something that both short and long term is going to affect, uh, affect your safety and, and health. And uh, as I said here, you know, we actually have a full scientific white paper on this topic on our site. It's free to download. So go ahead if you um, if you want to dig deeper into it. And I can also answer some questions at the end if you want to know more. So with all these uh, consequences, um, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting to look at what we have done in the past to address jet lag. Um, you know, unfortunately, we could do nothing but rely on advice from non-experts and trust false product claims. Um, I'll get back into uh, examples of uh, each of those um, uh, misconceptions. Uh, but most of us have just accepted jet lag as part of travel. And uh, again, like me, probably many don't believe that jet lag is something you can cure. It's just something you have to live with, uh, which is unfortunately uh, not the case. So, but what was needed to solve jet lag is also an interesting question because why wasn't it solved 10, 20, 30 years ago? We've had jet travel for quite a while. Well, number one, we needed the science to catch up. So uh, just like in the area of sleep, Circadian, by the way, has it goes way beyond sleep. So sleep is one of the areas that the circadian clock in our brain controls. And I'll go into the science in a little bit. But uh, sleep as well as circadian, um, you know, there's a lot of new studies and scientific evidence as to the implications. So the science needed to catch up. Number two, we needed a way to mass deliver personalized advice. And so the, um, the iPhone or Android devices um, can do that today. And then number three, of course, somebody credible had to uh, apply this science and get us excited about it and create uh, credibility around uh, the application of the science and the results. Uh, here I mentioned uh, NASA and Formula One, which are uh, two companies that um, uh, in fact were uh, some of the first to, to do that. And so with all of those three things in place, uh, we can now replace guessing with real science. One thing uh, I rarely talk about, but I thought would be interesting to this group, is the fact that the travel industry as a whole has completely missed the point when it comes to addressing jet lag. You know, if you ask uh, most airlines or hotels or uh, anyone that are trying to design a better travel experience, they've been focusing on sleep and fatigue. And that's just a complete wrong focus. You cannot force people to sleep when they are in a new time zone if they're not tired and you cannot get people to be energetic and and um, and and um, alert and awake uh, and focused uh, if 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 they are out of sync with the with the local time zone so you cannot force anyone to just do you know be alert and awake or 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 go to sleep so what we've missed is 
the underlying system is the circadian clock in our brain, which we'll go into depth with now. Um, the misalignment with the new time zone, that should be our sole focus. Forget about sleep, but get people adopted as quickly as possible to the new time zone so you can sleep naturally. And that's where the, the, the lack of expertise and science uh, is now coming to the forefront. So the circadian clock I'm talking about here, it sits in the hypothalamus part of our brain. Uh, that little dotted line shows you exactly where it's sitting. And uh, um, uh, it's a, for most of us, a 24 hour um, clock. Um, it might be a little bit quicker or, or, or slower. We'll get to that later. Um, and what's really interesting and surprising to many is the fact that the circadian clock, the, the key time cue for the clock is light and dark. So from the retina, as you can see, that yellow line that goes from the eye up to the circadian clock, uh, the sole purpose of this pathway is to deliver light and dark cue that enables the circadian clock to understand if it's daytime or night. And depending on what signals it gets, it starts to anticipate how it's going to be tomorrow. And that clock is a big driver of, of sleep. It's one of two parts of, of, of sleep. One is the drive for sleep, the other one is the circadian clock. So it's massively important. But light is the key time cue, not, not exercise, not food, not all this stuff that I'll talk about later. Uh, we've been doing so far to address jet lag. Um, another thing that can help with shifting quickly and impact uh, the circadian clock is melatonin supplement. And most of you might have tried melatonin supplements or might be using it today to address jet lag. Uh, so did I before I, I, um, I, um, I, I, I became part of Time Shifter. But what's really important about melatonin, using melatonin supplement is it does not work uh, to shift you quickly to a new time zone if you don't schedule the light exposure correctly. So without timing of light, melatonin won't help you shift quickly and reliably to a new time zone. The only thing it might do for you is you might get a little bit drowsy, which might be great because it's easier to fall asleep, but it doesn't shift the clock in the brain, which it could be doing to your advantage if you also time light exposure. And on top of timing light exposure, taking any type of melatonin also won't help. You have to use the right dose and the right type at the right time. Those three factors are equally important. And just you can see much more about this um, uh, when you, if you try Time Shifter or go to our website and look up melatonin. The right type and dose, by the way, is one to three milligrams quick release, not the five and 10 uh, milligrams slow release that many people are using. It, it just won't help except to make you a little bit drowsy. All right. So, what I just mentioned about uh, the timing of light and melatonin is reflected in this, what's called the phase response curve. I'm not going to talk about what it, it does other than to say this is the foundation of jet lag science and circadian science right here. This is showing you that by using melatonin at a certain time or being exposed to light after or before a certain time will shift your circadian clock either fast forward or fast backwards. And this is the whole, again, foundation that we should be looking at when creating solutions. OK, so now knowing what you now know about the science, um, let's dig into some of the things people have done before and why it isn't working. So this one is common, right? Get just get, get as much sleep as you can on the plane. Well, sleep equals darkness because you're closing your eyes. So now if you're sleeping at a time where you should have been exposed to light, to shift the clock the right direction and quickly, you're now you're now uh, shifting the, your circadian clock the wrong way, away from the new time zone. So now you're making jet lag much worse. So you might start out with a six or seven hours time zone difference between departure uh, and, uh, and, and the destination, and now you might arrive with eight or nine hours time zone difference, which is uh, really not good. Sleep medications also don't, it doesn't affect the circadian clock at all. Sleep medication can help you fall asleep. But again, like the previous example, you need to know when to sleep uh, and, and when it's okay to avoid uh, light. Um, if you know that, you can certainly use sleep medications uh, uh, when you talk to your medical, uh, medical professional, your physician about it, uh, in addition to time shifting, but you need to know when to sleep. Uh, and when to avoid light, to do it at the right time. 
Then a lot of uh, hotels and resorts are uh, having these uh, promotions about jet, special jet lag -like massages, acupuncture, or special diets. And listen, uh, diets, massages, acupuncture, none of this stuff will shift your circadian clock almost at all. The diet might uh, slightly um, shift you in one or another direction, but it's so weak a circadian synchronizer that it, it doesn't really pay almost, it's almost no difference. Uh, light, again, is the key time cue. Then there's uh, another one that I use for many, many years, which is when I got to new um, to my destination, I'd wake up in the next morning early, go to the gym or out for a run, because I felt that getting outside in the daylight and, and getting my body, you know, move my body would, would help me. And in fact, there's two things wrong with that. The first one is, again, that exercise does not shift your circadian clock uh, at all or very little. The other one is just imagine for a second that your circadian clock in the brain is back on your home time zone when you're running at 7 a.m. in the morning. It could be 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. at night in your circadian clock, and that's when you're running. Your body is not ready for a run, so that would be very counterproductive for your health and for, uh, for, that, um, for that event. So... Um, that's that's another reason why that might not be good. So stimulants like caffeine is actually quite good. It doesn't affect your circadian clock again, but it helps us with a little energy boost. But of course, also here, it's important with timing and knowing how to use uh, caffeine the best way, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. And then there's this you probably have seen in the in the in the pocket in front of you if you're on a new Dreamliner plane or one of the newer planes with LED lighting, they say this is going to help you with jet lag, the oxygen level, and the and the special LED lighting is going to help shift you towards the new time zone faster. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that it's it's just not correct because very often uh, the timing of light in the cabin is counterproductive to most passengers on the plane, shifting them the wrong way. So most airlines, they're optimizing uh, the light based on logistics. It's about meal services, getting them done. You know, it's all about optimizing the logistics during the trip. And, uh, and, and often that is not good for the passengers. So you need to know what's best for you. And you cannot trust the generic light that airplanes are giving you, even if they have good, great new lights. Travel in business class. Uh, it goes back to one of the first ones. It's great to have that, um, or in premium economy, it's great to have the sleep environment set up, but without knowing the timing, it won't really help you that much. You can sit in first class or business class and you can sleep at the wrong time and, and, and arrive with much more uh, jet lag than, than someone in the economy using time shifter to time things correctly. So it, it's a great additional benefit, but you need to to also know what your jet lag plan should be. And the same, of course, applies to a five-star hotel or better hotels. It's great to have a great environment, but most people, they end up waking up in the middle of the night, staring into the ceiling, and what good is it then to pay all that money for a great hotel? So with all of that, let me uh, discuss uh, the solution that we built and how it works in practice. There we go. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, our jet lag plan, our jet lag app, uh, we launched that in 2018, um, and uh, it was extremely well received, uh, even in the first version. Uh, it's not been replaced by much more sophisticated versions uh, that are more flexible and helpful to business travelers. Um, and uh, uh, with the science that we put inside, it's 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 actually four different uh, scientific areas that have been combined into one uh, that is amplifying the, the, the impact that the plan will have on people in, in, in both terms of quickly shifting you to new time zone, which we can do about three to four times as fast as normal, um, as well as uh, other advice that can support the plan, um, including, for example, when to take, when, milito when, when, sorry, when caffeine can be used with benefit and when you should avoid caffeine. Um, so that's the app. Um, we did it, we developed the app together with Dr. Stephen Lockley from Harvard Medical School, who is a world-renowned uh, sleep and circadian neuroscientist. Um, he's worked for many, many years with NASA to help them with jet lag, shift work, and peak performance before rocket launches, before spacewalks, 
uh, when the astronauts, they travel to Russia, Germany and Japan for training, they need to arrive and feel at their very best quickly so that they can get on with the training program versus sitting three or four or five days uh, and doing nothing, which would be extremely expensive for the space program. And then uh, uh, the last um, six, seven years, he's also helped Formula One drivers, other elite athletes, Olympic athletes, uh, top CEOs, et cetera, uh, with, uh, with peak performance and jet lag. Here's uh, one of the people that he, one of the astronauts that he uh, helped uh, and has helped. He's a former NASA astronaut, Michael Lopez uh, Alegria, uh, who has been to space four times, um, uh, was the commander on ISS for 215 days um, and uh, have done 10 spacewalks. In fact, if you guys have seen the movie Gravity uh, with George Clooney, uh, George Clooney's character is based on Michael's life and career at NASA. Um, Michael has, I think, only been beaded in terms of total uh, spacewalk time by a Russian. And I think it's, if I'm not wrong, 20 or 25 minutes, uh, the Russian um, uh, has a more uh, spacewalk time. So um, he is today uh, both investor and advisor to Time Shifter. We have some other astronauts, uh, part of our team, Mike Messimino, who is twice into space repairing the Hubble telescope and uh, who also um, was the first astronaut to tweet from space. So we're really trying to embrace, as I think you can hear, both the science and uh, very credible institutions uh, that have been applying the science in order to uh, get everyone excited about uh, the implications of what we uh, what what you can do to address jet lag. Um, here's some data uh, based on we actually have much more data now, but here is the first uh, uh, more than seventy thousand post travel surveys we did with our travelers. Uh, we asked them two questions after each trip. We said, how much did you follow uh, the advice in the app from one to five, and how much jet lag did you experience from one to five? And you, can, and you can see that uh, the people that follow the plan 80% or more of the time, uh, only 3.61% struggle with severe and very severe jet lag. Whereas if they didn't follow the advice to that same extent um, or at all, uh, there was a 17 time increase in experiencing severe, very severe jet lag. So it's a massive difference uh, that this is already making for travelers out there. Yeah, and the app has 4.7 out of 5 stars across app stores and countries. We have You can go on to the social networks and see all the uh, funny stories and exciting stories from people using TimeShifter. Um, and the really cool thing about it is it's very, very easy to use. The algorithm behind is super sophisticated uh, and advanced, but the user experience is very, uh, very easy. It takes less than a minute to, uh, to create a jet lag plan. Uh, we need some basic information about you, your normal sleep pattern, your chronotype, if you're an early bird, a night owl, or neither, and we need your itinerary. Um, and then based on that, we create a jet lag plan that's highly personalized for you and for that specific trip. Um, uh, the plan will include things like when to prioritize light and when to avoid light. It'll include information about when to take melatonin if you opted in for using melatonin. If you don't want to use melatonin, that's fine. Light is the key time cue, and you can effectively shift very quickly, uh, even without using melatonin, but it adds a little bit more speed to it. And then when to go to sleep, when to use caffeine and when to avoid caffeine. We even include information about how to use caffeine the best way, so it's smaller doses more often rather than a big dose uh, more rarely. Uh, and avoiding caffeine, why avoid caffeine? Well, because uh, caffeine stays in the blood for up to eight hours. So we do not want you to have that caffeine, that, you know, caffeine before you go to bed. Even if you can fall asleep, your sleep quantity and quality might be affected by it. Uh, if you use any of the sleep measuring devices, monitoring devices that are available uh, on the consumer market today, you can try one night with caffeine before you go to bed and one night without, and you'll see how your deep and your, your deep sleep and your REM sleep is affected by the caffeine. Um, so it's not a good thing. All right. And then uh, many, many people ask us, uh, well, uh, you're saying we should prioritize light, but what if we're in an, in an airplane and it's completely dark? The light is turned off. What do we do? You just simply turn on your uh, computer, your in-flight entertainment system, uh, increase the brightness to full, uh, turn on the light above you, and uh, you you watch a movie or do some work, and that's enough 
artificial strong light to shift your clock three to four times as fast as normal towards the new time zone. And then what about uh, being at your destination? You uh, have agreed to a lunch, you're sitting outside in the sun and you should be avoiding light. Uh, what are you going to do? You just put on your, your dark sunglasses and now you are protecting your circadian clock against uh, the strong light that would otherwise shift you in the wrong direction. So it's very easy to do. A couple of uh, innovative features I, I, I want to highlight that are especially important for business travelers or any traveler actually, but uh, one of them is especially designed for business travelers. But the first one I want to highlight is the practicality filter. So if you took the raw science and made it into an algorithm and started to give you advice based on that, you wouldn't be able to comply with your jet lag plan. Why? Because it would include advice where you should stay up during the day or you should stay up during the night and sleep in during the day. Or, or what about when you arrive to Hong Kong, uh, it might say go to sleep. Well, you can't go to sleep because you need to get your luggage from the from the luggage belt. You need to get into a cab, go to the hotel, check in, uh, you know, get to your room, unpack your toilet bag, brush your teeth before you can go to bed and sleep. So the practicality filter we build in has hundreds of different situations built in where we know it's not realistic for you to follow this in real life. And then we've tweaked it so that the ongoing advice will be uh, if, if effective. Uh, so this is easy to comply with in the, in the real world. The quick turnaround feature is also important because now you're going to Hong Kong and then you are only staying for one day and then you go back the next day. Well, what we're going to do, what our algorithm is going to do in that case is it's not going to help you shift quickly to, to Hong Kong. It's just going to try to make you perform well when you're there and then try to get you back on your home time zone as quickly as possible. So we're trying to avoid a full adaptation there, but get you to perform at your best when you're there. All right. So let's see. Yeah. So one, uh, let me give you an example of a real trip, how that, um, uh, you know, using time shifter versus not using time shifter or applying the science versus not applying the science, how that impacts a trip. So I live in New York. I am from Denmark originally. I moved here to New York 14 years ago. And uh, so I've been back and forth many times to Denmark and also to Europe in general. And of course, this is a six time zone difference and it's going east, which is bad for me. Um, it's not bad for everyone, but most people have more difficulty shifting east um, the flight I have taken the most time uh, left from JFK Airport at 11.30 at night, and then I would arrive the next day at 12.30 in the afternoon. And before time shifter, I would go to the airport in JFK, uh, spend a couple of hours in the airport, you know, experiencing bright light in the terminal, shop around or do some work on my computer, watch a movie while I waited for the plane to get ready. And then when boarding the plane, of course, they have dinner service. So I would have dinner uh, and then experiencing again bright light in the cabin. And then I'd go to sleep and try to sleep as long as I could, even until I arrived in Copenhagen Airport, which is at 1230 in the afternoon. So kind of that doesn't make sense, right? Because that would be the equivalent of sleeping in. You know, all the Danes at that point have been up for six hours or something like that. So it, it, it sort of doesn't make sense. Uh, and I can see that. And the consequences of doing it that way, following the airplane's uh, uh, lighting and meal services uh, is making everything much worse. Um, when I got to Denmark, it'd be really difficult for me to get up in the morning uh, the days after. And the reason why, of course, is because my circadian clock in my head is back in New York where it's in the middle of the night. So it'd be really difficult to get up in the morning. And then the second night, I would typically wait up between 1 to 3 a.m. and couldn't fall back asleep. So I would start watching TV shows, um, do all the wrong things, um, and which would screw up my adaptation even more. Uh, so certainly not great. And then coming back to New York and my family with a nine-year-old and 11-year-old now, but uh, also as they were younger, they just wanted to play and have some some uh, some time with me. And I would be an absolute zombie uh, and, uh, and not be, uh, uh, you know, I would do it, but I wouldn't feel great about it. And, uh, and certainly couldn't be engaging as much as I wanted to both at work and at, at home for several days. So not a great example. With time shifter, I go out to JFK airport at night, two hours before the flight. I would, it, it, the plane would tell me to avoid light. So in the airport, I'd run around with sunglasses on. And of course, um, 
you know, I'm sure some people would think I was a little bit weird. Other people would might think I was a celebrity or something, but um, but that's what it takes. You put on the sunglasses, you avoid the light. I would eat dinner at the airport with my sunglasses on. And then the moment I got on board the plane, I would take that one milligram fast release melatonin and I would put my sleep mask on. And then uh, I would sleep for the next four hours, three to four hours, and then wake up. So I'd do the opposite of most of the flight. I'd wake up when most of them went to bed or had only been asleep for an hour or two. Um, and uh, then I would, uh, the plan told me to, or tells me to prioritize bright light. So I turn on the in-flight entertainment system on my computer, as much brightness as possible, the light above me. And the rest of the trip, I would enjoy the breakfast service and uh, arrive to Copenhagen. Doing it that way, my clock was already shifted tremendously uh, towards Copenhagen time zone. And uh, I would wake up 7, 7.30 in the morning uh, automatically, not just with an alarm clock. And I would sleep through every night. And then, of course, doing the same on the way back using the plan. Um, I'd be ready to uh, either go to work and feel great or or spend time with my family in a more meaningful way. So massive difference from, from my life and I know for many others that are now using it. So, um, there are some people that says, oh, I've been doing some of that uh, already or um, or is this something you can learn? And, and, the, and, the, and the answer is no, not really, because it's very complicated to put it together. Even scientists uh, get it wrong. Um, it, this is not just a matter of going to bed a little bit later or a little bit earlier before your flight. This is about light exposure and it's not intuitive. It's very counterintuitive sometimes how that uh, pans out. And so the sleep itself is only important because you're closing your eyes and therefore avoiding light and you have to do that at the right time but sleep itself is actually not as much a factor as as the the light exposure part of it that's what's shifting you in the right or the wrong direction and here's a couple of examples of how personalized this stuff is in fact some other people ask us well can't i just use the same jet lag plan as my colleague we're going to the same meeting in you know in 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 uh, in, in europe can we just use the same plan and again, the answer is no, it's so personalized to the individual that uh, plans will be different. Here's one example. So here is uh, two plans, one uh, the, the, or two people traveling. They have the same sleep pattern. So they're both going to bed at 11 o'clock at night. They're getting up at seven o'clock in the morning. They have the same chronotype. I'll talk to you about chronotype in a minute, but really are you an early bird or night owl or neither? Uh, but they have different departure time. One is leaving two hours earlier than the other person traveling to the same place. Two different plans. And then uh, before I give you the second example, let me just explain something I found fascinating, which is uh, what is a chronotype? There actually is a biological answer to why some people get up earlier and feel better earlier and some people are better at night. Early birds have a circadian clock that's between 23 and, and a half and 24 hours in speed. So it's faster than the night owl's circadian clock. That's why they wake up earlier. The circadian clock is faster. Whereas night owls, which uh, includes me, um, it's slower. Uh, it's between 24 and 25 hours long. And so we wake up later and function better uh, later in the day. Um, the ones that are really sort of in between and function okay in the morning, function great at night, they're neither. Their clock is probably around 24 hours as the rotation of the planet around the sun. <coughs> okay, so the second example I wanted to give you is quite funny. So let's just assume that one of the travelers uh, on, is an early bird. The other one is a night owl. You're going on the same uh, flight to the other side of the world and you have the same sleep pattern, but you have different chronotypes. So the sleep pattern and chronotypes are not the same, right? Because we have a socially determined wake up time. We might have kids we need to bring to school. I brought my daughter this morning at seven o'clock. Although I'm a night owl, I don't function well, but I still need to get up. Um, but these two travelers have same sleep pattern, same itinerary, but different chronotypes. They're going to the other side of the world. In the jet lag plan, we will shift the early bird east around the globe. Although they're on the same plane, the plan would shift them east. The night owl will shift them west because it's easier for an early bird to shift east and it's easier for a night owl to shift west around the world in terms of time zones. So um, so that's pretty, I think, fascinating. Um, 
I think it's also exciting to see that the travel industry uh, really are embracing all of this new science and looking for ways to address jet lag and sleep when people travel for both their performance, their health and safety. Um, there's also an increasing number of companies that are looking to improve the travel experience for their uh, for their travelers, their employees, um, um, to address those uh, different problems. And if you happen to be a company, I just quickly will mention this and we'll get on with the Q&A. Uh, if you are a company, it's really easy to, um, to deploy something like this. It's an app. There are systems for implementing this really quickly using gift codes or an email address, uh, corporate email address. And we're even working with uh, SAP Concour and TMCs to embed it so you as a company really don't have to do much to, uh, to make it available. And then we have some different implementation materials uh, with you know astronauts and, and scientists talking about it. And then a monthly report where we show efficacy and return on investment. We show how many people used it, uh, how do they reply to compliancy? How did they self-report their jet, you know, how much jet lag they experienced? What's the demographics? What are the top 10 airports, airlines, routes that people used it on? And we can even include potential and actual cost savings uh, based on uh, some assumptions that we can share with you and based on uh, the, the specific um, travel profile uh, of your company. Um, the last thing I want to mention is just that uh, we're, we're super thrilled and uh, and proud that um, uh, it's been received so well and we've been recognized with different awards. Um, uh, you might have seen us out there uh, on, on, on different events at GP, GPTA last year in Chicago, Web Summit in Portugal, Focus Ride in Florida. Uh, we try to be uh, all of those places and are, are really excited that everyone is supportive of of, uh, of, of this new discovery and, and this new uh, solution. Uh, so that's my end of my, uh, my, my presentation, ready for questions if you have any. And I just made available to you, if you want one to try it out, a free subscription. If you use that code on the screen uh, and go to that URL, uh, you can claim a, uh, a completely free uh, one year subscription. And if you want to get in touch and ask questions, you're, you're able to do that using the email or the phone number on the screen. Thank you very much. Well, well thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Uh, we really appreciate that, and it's a lot of information. We <laughs> do have some questions and comments, and I do want to say uh, before we get to the Q and A, and Tanya will take that over just shortly. Uh, Charlie Grapone, who is on our organizational team, uh, and we want to say congratulations to him. He, his wife just had a baby, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and so he is not on this call, but he did indicate that he has used this app and was very uh, happy with it and enjoyed it. And I'm sorry that he's not here to make his own personal comments, but there are quite a few questions and um, comments on here. And I'm going to hand this over to Tanya. Thank you, Carmen. Sure. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, Mickey. Um, the first question is from Cindy. She says she's used the Jet Lab. Lab, lag app, but it stated she didn't sleep enough, so it could not give her any more information. Can people who don't sleep eight hours not use the app? So uh, we we have tried to be a little bit educational. So uh, if I understand the question correctly, in the app you are stating your sleep pattern, and uh, there is a limit to how many hours that we allow people to sleep and how few hours we allow people to sleep in the app. So we, we don't allow for less than six hours and we don't allow for more than nine hours uh, of, of, of sleep duration when you enter that information. But we also describe in the app why we don't do it, uh, which is really, um, you know, if you, if you need to sleep more than nine hours, if it's nine and a half hours, you still put it at nine, not, you, it's fine to have nine hours sleep duration in the app as a setting. Uh, half an hour doesn't make um, a tremendous uh, difference. But I would say uh, any sleep expert I've talked to would say if you sleep more than or need more than nine hours of sleep, you probably should go and get it checked because it might there might be a cause of it. I'm not saying that there is, but nine hours is sort of the, you know, it, it's, a, it's a lot. Um, and some people need it. I need eight hours and I cannot function well without eight hours, but nine hours is... Um, 
uh, it should certainly be checked if there's an, a sleep disorder or something else going on. Um, less than six hours. I know some people are sleeping only five and a half hours or five hours. If they do so, it's okay in the app to put it at six hours of total sleep. Um, that's fine. And the advice will be accurate enough for you to for it to work really well. Um, but we don't encourage it. Six hours, there are some few examples of people that really don't need more than five hours. But most people having five hours of sleep, it's because of an alarm clock, right? They're getting up uh, before they should get up. Um, I would say as a little uh, extra advice that doesn't really uh, has anything to do with circadian science, but I'd say there are two things day to day that are important for us in terms of getting good sleep and functioning well. One of them is to find your optimal uh, bedtime. And that's really trying to make sure that when you wake up in the morning, you will be woken up naturally and not by your alarm clock. So what you do is you, you know, the, uh, think the, the uh, CDC are saying you should have about seven and a half hours on average in, in sleep. So try, if you're getting up at six o'clock, try to go to bed at, um, at uh, 1030 and, uh, and then uh, set your alarm clock for six. If the alarm clock goes on with, and wakes you up, try to go to bed 15 minutes earlier the next day and 15 minutes the next day until you wake up at six o'clock without the alarm clock. So that's one aspect I would highly recommend, a method to really figuring out how much sleep you really need. The other thing I'd mention is be consistent. So the circadian clock in our brains loves, loves, loves consistency. It wants you to go to bed the same time every day and it wants you to wake up the same time every morning. And that's part of why jet lag and jet travel makes things really bad. It's because it doesn't like the disruption. If you can stick to it on a daily basis, if you were to stay up a little longer on a Friday night or Saturday night and, 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 and because of social activities and stuff, then try not to sleep in the next day more than half an hour, 40 minutes max. And then instead take a nap between one and three in the afternoon instead because you really don't want the circadian clock to move before it gets Monday again, then Sunday night you might not be able to fall asleep early and get up early Monday morning before you have to go to work. So I'd really recommend the consistency uh, uh, in terms of the sleep pattern. Wonderful, thank you so much. There's another question that is, um, if people don't have the app, what are simple ways that will help alleviate jet lag? So you, you simply can't. Um, uh, there, there really isn't any, anything you can do. Um, um, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can use sleep aids to try to fall asleep, but it won't shift the clock. Again, back to the things I mentioned before, you know, any blog post or any article you read about jet lag that has three bullets saying, this is the stuff you need to do to alleviate jet lag are wrong. They're wrong. All of them are wrong. There are none of them that are correct. It is misconceptions. It is wrong facts. The science are dictating exactly what you need to do to tackle the underlying cause of jet lag. So all that we've been doing uh, void of, of, of this science and of time shifter is we've tried to address the symptoms. But, but most of us are failing at it, right? Because it's sort of a, yeah, I'm still tired or, you know, or now I made it worse. I thought, you know, there is no way of knowing uh, if somebody has, uh, you know, been a business traveler for 20, 30, 50 years, maybe they have certain things they've learned on certain routes. And, and, and over time, that totally happens. So someone has figured out something that makes it a little bit easier. But in general, I would say anything generic uh, just doesn't work. It's not, it's not going to help the underlying cause of jet lag. And you would be much better off um, you know, getting a personalized plan from Time Shifter, or as as more solutions will come out, which uh, evidently will happen, uh, use one of those as long as they're based on the timing of light. Anything that's not based on timing of light are wrong. Acupuncture, there's an app for that. It doesn't shift the circadian clock. There is no high quality clinical studies that are making uh, that that are proving that. So. Um, the reason why I personally are excited about what we're doing is because we're using real science. We're using clinically documented, well-documented, high-quality science from Harvard, Stanford, and all universities, and we have one of the leading experts in the world on the on the team 
Uh, that's why it works. So yeah, really no generic answer. Wonderful. Thanks, Mickey, for addressing that. Also, there um, is another question. What is the cost for this app? So, uh, you know, we, what we do on the App Store, if you're just a consumer is, uh, I mean, you guys are getting it all for free for a year. So, um, but um, if you're a consumer, normally you go to the App Store, the first trip is free, completely free, uh, one way round trip, uh, multi-city, whatever kind of itinerary you have, it's free. And then you can buy another plan for 10 bucks, so you can subscribe for $25 a year. For businesses, we've just updated our pricing structure based on the whole COVID-19 situation where we know that many businesses don't want to subscribe to something they might not use. So what we've done instead is we've made some packages. You can buy 25 jet lag plans, 100 jet lag plans, or 500 jet lag plans. And then as travelers are using them in your company, we just deduct those trips and when you only have 25% of the trips left, we email you and say you should buy some more. So uh, it, 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 this is like you will, they would never expire and, uh, and we charge um, $20 per trip, uh, regardless again, if it's one way round trip or multi-city. And the reason why it's a little bit more expensive for businesses is that they're also getting reporting, they're getting priority support, they're getting some other stuff that consumers are not getting. Wonderful. Um, there was a comment that said there was, uh, I believe it's Vilia, if, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing that right. She said, I recommended this app to an employee who traveled from, who traveled and made sure to let me, he made sure to let me know that the app helped him very much. She also recommended it to a family member and she said that she had energy, but the group that went with her was fatigued. So she said she's a very big fan of Time Shifter. Oh, that's awesome. Um, the next question comes from Beatrice. I, can, I, can I just mention one thing uh, around that? Because we had, um, we, um, I spoke in Singapore last year at the Global Wellness Summit, um, and uh, we gave time shifter trips to all of the delegates there, and many of them flew in from uh, from US to Singapore, a big trip. Uh, and some, the, the ones that used it, they had the benefits, and the ones that didn't use it. But some people came up to me and said, I used it, but I didn't benefit. And we realized that um, it's because they followed only part of the advice. So as I mentioned during this presentation, we also include uh, caffeine advice, but that doesn't shift your clock. It's basically just to help you with more energy and, and have you avoid caffeine at certain times, not to disrupt the sleep quality and quantity at night. So here's the key. If you're trying out Time Shifter, the most important advice in the app is following the timing of light. And it's okay, you don't get it right all the time. And if you have a business meeting and it says avoid light, take off the sunglasses and have the business meeting and then put them on afterwards. One hour is fine. You don't need to follow it 100% to really benefit, but, but don't ignore the light advice and follow caffeine advice. That will defeat the purpose. The main key in the, in the plan is really following light and melatonin if you opted in for that. Um, and I, let me just interject real quick, Tanya. Uh, the flight patterns that they were talking about, Mickey, were from San Antonio to Chennai in India, and then the other trip was from Chicago here to, to Honolulu. I do have a quick question as a segue to what you just said. I have transitional lenses. <laughs> so yep. in the case of timing, I, whenever I go out into the sun or light, my glasses automatically shift to the darker shade. Is there a way to avoid that or do you have a different approach to that, you know, with folks that have the type of glasses that I have on? Uh, that's a that's a really that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I would if, if, if the app is specifically saying prioritize bright light, um, there is another advice that says see some light. See some light means basically don't be in darkness. So it's any light. It doesn't matter how little or much it is. Just don't be in darkness. But if it specifically says see light, then the more light, the better. And of course, sunlight is the best light source on the in, in the universe. So, you know, it it um, you know any artificial light will suffice. But if you have sunglasses, dark dark sunglasses on, when you're out in the sun and you should be prioritizing light, it won't be as good as if you took them off or had some normal glasses without the transition lens because it, it, it does really matter. You could, this, the, the raw sunlight without sunglasses would do wonders for you. So uh, 
I don't know what to do if you have a second pair of glasses without the transition lenses. But I mean, maybe that's what you need to go and get if you want to be fully compliant. But um, that's a great question. And and also, by the way, um, a little uh, side uh, note that uh, I found fascinating, I think you might as well. Many of you have probably heard about blue light is bad also at night in bed on your iPad or phone. Don't look at your phone before you go to bed. It's absolutely true. That um, and that's part of this science I've explained to you today. That light is so powerful, and it sends a signal to your brain or to the circadian clock saying it's day when you're lying in bed trying to fall asleep, and it's trying to get your body to function. So and it suppresses melatonin, which is a hormone in your body. It's not just a supplement; it actually is a hormone. It suppresses melatonin production, and melatonin is what you want in your body when you're going to sleep. It helps you fall asleep. Um, so so. So absolutely don't look at iPads and iPhones in bed if you can avoid it an hour or two before bed. Uh, great advice. But uh, my real point here is, is the bluish light. Many hear that the blue light is what really is, is the bad light when you need to, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, avoid light. And it's not true. Any light matters. Blue is really bad, but any light matters. So... Uh, although there are many products out there, there are you know, some special blue bloggers, and you might think, you know, this is this is this is the best solution for me when I need to avoid light. It's not. Your own dark sunglasses are better. Um, you know, when I sit in the plane, I'm 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 sort of hacking a little bit my own jet lag plans. If I don't want to go to sleep on the plane, if I can't sleep at the time where the app tells me to go to sleep. I'm avoiding light instead because the light, it, it, the plan expects me to avoid light when I sleep because again, I close my eyes or should close my eyes. So if I can't sleep or don't want to sleep as much as is outlined, instead I put my dark sunglasses on, on the plane and I read a book, even though it's difficult, I read a book or I can even watch a movie when I dim it down and put my sunglasses on. It's almost just the sound I benefit from. I can see a little bit, but, uh, it, it shifts you in the right direction. It makes a huge difference. That's a that's great, Mickey. That's a great recommendation. Um, Beatrice has a question. She says, what happens to people who cannot sleep on a plane at all? Do you have any recommendations? Yes. So the recommendation is, I mean, certainly try and relax. Um, uh, and again, for the purpose of, uh, of shifting your clock in the brain, it doesn't really care if you sleep or not. It cares about the light exposure. So it's aligned with the, what I just mentioned before. If you can't sleep, then avoid light. Um, so what I do is either I keep my sleep mask on, I meditate, I relax, I just, you know, uh, it's fine. Um, or I put on dark sunglasses. If I absolutely must do something else and I'm bored, I put on my dark sunglasses okay. instead while I should be sleeping. And then you'll be surprised how powerful your circadian clock is. When you get to your destination, even if you didn't get as much sleep as you normally get, if you are doing this type of advice, the circadian clock will start to impact you and get you going when your sleep drive is big. You otherwise really need to go to sleep. Your circadian clock can help you. And uh, of course, combine that with a little bit of caffeine at the right time. And, and we also in the app have optional naps. So if you happen to be tired because you didn't get enough sleep on the plane, that's not jet lag. It's just sleep deprivation. We can then tell you what the best time for you to close your eyes for 30 minutes uh, would be. And you get there. Great. Um, there was a uh, request. Could you explain circadian clock in more layman terms, please? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, the circadian clock is actually something that exists in both humans and in plants. It was discovered first in plants. So um, if we go back in time before the external clock time as we know it began, uh, humans uh, functioned based on, you know, our whole lives were um, was um, designed around the sun, right? The sun got up, we got going, we went out to hunt, we, we got some breakfast, we ate. And then before the sun would set, we would eat our dinner. We'd go to bed early. Uh, we might wake up in the middle of the night and be awake for an hour or two and, you know, whatever that entailed, uh, meditate or, um, and then uh, we'd, we'd, we'd start all over. We would be completely in sync with nature. And the problem is we're not in sync with nature anymore, but our bodies are designed for that. 
and we and and the bodies it'll take millions of years for human evolution to get to a point where jet travel and shift work is is uh, is embedded in our ability to function so the the invention of jet travel the invention of artificial light has completely screwed up our circadian clocks and our schedules and so the reason why external clock time, of course, began was we needed to start scheduling things later on in the human evolution. We had trains, you know, uh, coming in and you needed to have a departure time and arrival time so you could, you know, get on the train. And so we invented this external clock term, which really at the end of the day is completely made up. It's it, it's uh, it's something we came up with out of the blue, just like time zones. Uh, but our bodies are still craving for that consistent schedule based on when the sun goes up and sun goes down. And the and the clock is is right here in the brain, but actually we also have clocks in almost all of our organs, in our cells, in our lungs, in our heart, in our liver. We have 24-hour clocks. And what the way to think about this clock up in our brain and the ones in our body is that the one in the brain is the conductor to the orchestra, which is in the body, but but our organs really have clocks. So that's why some of us, when we travel, we have we have a you know problems with the metabolism, diarrhea, other problems. It's because our body is out of sync with a schedule, with the expectations, with the assumptions where we should be at that time. And so the clock has huge implications for our lives and for our safety, health, and performance. And you'll see over the next five years, circadian as a science is going to completely change. It's going to personalize, it's going to change medicine. It's going to open up completely new opportunities. It, it certainly is a uh, certain impacts and one of the things that impacts sleep, but it also controls metabolism, hormones, uh, reproductive system, all of those different processes are affected by a circadian clock. So it's uh, it's. It's something that we all will hear much more about and will have way more and bigger implications than the sleep science that are out so far, which people now take seriously. So just hang on for the you know next few years and see what um, you might have medication that's uh, where the timing is personalized. You might take a vaccine at a different time of day because you get more you know antibodies. Uh, you might, I mean, there are shift workers, their lives are, uh, are really impacted by by, by this as well, right? With increased uh, cancer, certain certain cancer, stroke, diabetes, uh, heart disease, etc. Um, you know, once we start to realize not only the implications but also the 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 ways to intervene, we're going to have a very different life. Um, most of us. Wonderful. Well, we are certainly appreciative of your time today. Mickey, uh, it has been very interesting, very informative. I hope educational for all of you. Uh, we are out of time in terms of our questions. We do have several others. Uh, what we will do, Mickey, if you don't mind, we will uh, email those to you and if you sure. could answer those and we will send those out uh, with our follow up of this recording of the call. Uh, but everyone, we are so grateful that you took the time out this afternoon. We want to thank Mickey Bayer Clausen of Time Shifter uh, for scheduling his time with us and joining us on this call. Uh, as per usual, we will see you in two weeks for our next Return to Travel series. Everyone, have a great afternoon, and we will see you later. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mickey. Bye.